It was in 2017, as one of the highlights of the 19th CPC National Congress, that CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping first gave the directive to implement the strategy of rural vitalization. He called it a major strategy that would have fundamental impact on the nation. What is this strategy? What are its basic elements, its characteristics? What's its ultimate goal? And why now, after decades of concern about its rural areas, is China giving such priority to rural vitalization? Moreover, given China's huge population, vast territory, regional differences, and large gaps and disparities, what challenges does rural vitalization face? What are the critical success factors? It has been almost two years since rural vitalization was elevated to highest priority. What has been happening? There is no better topic to be closer to China. This man is Tang Changjun, the party secretary of Yuango Village. This man is Qin Xiao. This year, Qin Zhao has contracted seven greenhouses to grow strawberries. Soil moisture matters much for growing strawberries. Located in a hilly area, Yuango's arable land is scattered, making scale farming impossible here. After learning greenhouse operations from Shandong, the Yuango's village committee and village party branch decided to build their own greenhouse planting business. To get a good harvest, Chin needs good strawberry seedlings. Last year, greenhouse contractors in Yuango had a good harvest. Strawberries, chilies, and tomatoes all sold well in the market. Twelve greenhouses were built by Yuengo Village. Because fruit and vegetables sell well, village leadership transferred contracting rights to villagers. Tang Changjun and his colleagues help every new contractor to select seedlings. Chin Chao's family used to be a poor household. His wife has been suffering from schizophrenia, causing high medical expenses for this poor family. Yuango Village used to be a province-level poor village in Hanan. It had another 39 poverty-stricken households like Jin Chao's family. With policy support from higher levels of government, Mengzhou City and Jiaozuo City, at the end of 2017, this village eliminated poverty. 
Training for greenhouse contractors was held. Organized by the village committee, the training aims to teach new contractors skills for managing greenhouses. After shaking off poverty, as the expression goes, to vitalize the village is the next goal. Greenhouse professionals from Shandong are invited to share experiences. With eight new greenhouses under construction, there are altogether 20 greenhouses here. Tourists are attracted to experience agricultural harvesting, which provides steady income for the small village. The next day, Chin Chow came to the greenhouse to water the land, making the soil wet enough for plowing. Since Chin is inexperienced, Tang Chang Jun came to help almost every procedure. After watering the land, Chin Chow would plow seven greenhouses with the help of professionals with a strawberry ridger. Before plowing the land, fertilization was the final step. The machine was eight hours late due to road congestion caused by heavy rain. The moment the machine arrived, anxiety changed into excitement. Chinese the machine could complete the plowing in a few minutes. The seed of hope for a good harvest and earning money is also sowed. Agricultural, rural areas, farmers, this has been China's priority for the entire existence of the People's Republic of China. Why that's the case is obvious because of the great percentage of uh, the population in rural areas. What I'd like to understand is what have been the changes of policies regarding agricultural, rural areas, and farmers over the decades? Fourteen years ago, China proposed a new socialist countryside with a host of policies, like abolishing agricultural taxes and increasing agricultural input. Each year, trillions of yuan might be invested with the hope of bringing progress to rural areas in China. Take another example. Five years ago, China issued policies on targeted poverty alleviation, which were meant to lift over 70 million rural residents out of poverty. Huge human, material, and financial resources have been invested under this policy. 
In 2017, at the 19th CPC National Congress, a broader strategy, the Rural Vitalization Strategy, was proposed, and the goal remains the same, to break the dual structure in China. The rural vitalization is roughly divided into three stages spanning 33 years. For the first three years, from 2018 to 2020, the CPC Central Committee will set up an institutional framework and policy system, or the so-called top-level designs. Then, local governments choose some places as pilots based on local practices. In the next 15 years, the goal is to make key breakthroughs with the modernization of agriculture and rural areas as an indicator. Looking at that grand vision, what would you say are the primary challenges or even obstacles to achieve the goals? To realize this goal, we face many difficulties. A crucial predicament is that our past institutions have favored facilitating human resources, material and financial resources to cities to enhance them. Unfortunately, declining hollow villages were born. To remove the hurdles, one crucial measure is to reform. As a major strategy proposed at the 19th CPC National Congress, the implementation of rural vitalization strategy will have profound impact on China, considering its large rural population. Can you give some examples of how Hunan implements this strategy? How is vitalizing its rural economy happening or addressing issues relating to agricultural rural areas and rural people? I think we can fulfill the strategy for rural vitalization from four aspects. First, enhance organizational leadership. Second, lead with sound plans. Third, carry out development plans according to local conditions. And fourth, let farmers play a major role. For example, Chenjiagao village in Henan province. It's the birthplace of Taiji, so it enjoys a traditional cultural advantage. It plans to consolidate with neighboring villages into a medium-sized village and to drive industrial development with culture at its core. Nowadays, tens of thousands of people come here to study Tai Chi every year. The Tai Chi study-related industries encourage this influx of people and materials, drawing talent and capital there. Villages with better conditions and close to townships are to be built into central townships, through which they'll consolidate human resources, drive industrial growth, and upgrade functions. Some villages, however, will eventually die out. For those villages, first we do our basic work well to ensure fairness and justice. Second, considering further development, we guide the people who live there into central villages to promote village building. Evening meetings have become routine for the Urango Village Committee and Village Party Branch. At this meeting, village representatives are present as well. After eliminating poverty in 2017, Yuango is working to build thriving businesses. Besides greenhouse planting, Yuango is also seeking other ways. As one of the pilot villages in Mengzhou City, Yuango is promoting the reform of the rural collective property rights system, gathering resources and assets in the village, land for example, to make them collectively owned. Each villager registers to become a shareholder, owning equity based on his or her conditions like age and huko residency status, and can then receive dividends from the collective revenue. Under this reform, five shareholding cooperatives will be established. Shareholder representatives will be selected by villagers. From the shareholder representatives, trustees and supervisors will be selected by the village party organization. When conditions are favorable, five cooperatives will regroup into one investment company of the village. Obviously, it is not easy to get everyone clear. <laughs> the next afternoon, after hearing the news, villages came to the village committee office to register. This 
After an entire afternoon of registration, members of the village committee and village party branch gathered in the yard, discussing the remaining questions and work to follow. The big meeting of villages was on. After hearing the news, all who lived in the village, the old and the young, came. The meeting ended, but the discussion did not. People continued talking about being shareholders and the cooperatives' prospects. Tang Chong Jun was elected by the CPC members of the village as village party secretary in 2011 due to both his integrity and mastery of making money. He used to be a driver from 1996 to 2007, earning in the end more than 4,500 yuan per month or about $630. From 2007 to 2015, he made money by raising pigs. For example, raising 200 pigs per year brought him about 50 to 60,000 yuan, or about 7,000 to 8,000 dollars. Now, as party secretary, his monthly salary is 2,599 yuan, or about 365 dollars, less than 4,400 dollars per year. We use the term the Chinese government as if it's one uh, huge entity, uh, and in fact there are six different parts of it. The central government is, is one, but and then we have five levels of local government, provincial, municipal, county, township, and village. Each one has a party organization that is in charge. Each one has a party secretary, which is in charge of the party committees in those areas. So when we have these big programs, how is it determined who does what when you have these six levels? And if we say the central government gives the policy and provides the funding in some cases, how then do the five levels of local government are, work together? How do they decide who does what in each kind of project? It is an institution worth talking about. We propose party secretaries at five levels to be held accountable for targeted poverty alleviation. Party secretaries at five levels have also been called on to be responsible for rural vitalization. Party secretaries at the provincial, municipal, prefectural, county, township, and village levels should respond to the grand goals set by the central government. It is an integral institution. For grand goals set by the CPC Central Committee, each province, county, township, and village has its plans. The CPC Central Committee has promised that village party secretaries that grow villages well, compared with other villages, would get promoted. Such a promotion mechanism has proven to be an effective way. Village officials who fail to do their work well will be punished. For example, county party secretaries of counties ranked at the bottom within a province would be demoted. What is the role of the local party organizations, the local party secretaries in coordination, and the farmers themselves? How do they participate in the process of governance? With so many villages in China, local governments have a significant role to play in organizing farmers. Like I said, the CPC Central Committee proposed another strategy of rural organization vitalization, that is, to enrich the grassroots cadres team by sending a great number of little village officials, 
namely college graduates who run a village, youth who return to the countryside, and teachers or other professionals who station themselves in the countryside. There is a saying in China that cadres are determining factors to a village's prosperity. Without building rural grassroots organizations, and with no one to organize, simply relying on farmers themselves is unlikely to achieve rural vitalization. Building grassroots organizations, particularly with the party organization at its core, serves as a crucial guarantee for rural vitalization. In recent years, Konan has been enhancing its rural party organization building by appointing capable people we call leading geese, the secretaries of rural party branches. Li Lianchang, the party secretary of Xixinjuang Village and a delegate to the National People's Congress, once proposed at an NPC session to turn his village into a city. It is the farmer's dream, he said. Back then, many people, including theorists, wonder how a village could turn into a city. But it's a city in quotation marks, Li answered. It's a concept to enshrine farmers' aspirations, party policies, and village organizational goals into city-like conditions. Li wanted to ensure that people in his village could live a life similar to their urban counterparts. It's a goal pursued by grassroots organizations. This goal is clear and easy to understand. At the 19th National Congress of the CPC, Xi Jinping put forth the strategy of rural vitalization, making developmental agriculture and rural areas a priority of the party. As a large agricultural province, Hunan has a large rural population and various cases in implementing the rural vitalization strategy. From June 27th to 29th, 2019, Hunan's achievements in practicing Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era thematic briefing was held in Zhengzhou, the capital of Hunan. Organized by the International Department of the CPC and the Hunan Provincial Party Committee, the event attracted more than 300 representatives of foreign political parties from over 30 countries. During their trip, attendees visited places exemplifying good practice of rural vitalization, heard real-life stories of villages building industries and eliminating poverty, and shared their views on China's rural vitalization. We ask what they feel about what they saw and heard here. From your perspective, what is unique about China's strategy in rural revitalization? Can you compare it to Sri Lanka's policy on rural development and agriculture? I think, the again, it's to do with leadership. Sri Lanka does not have the economies of scale yet. Uh, we can. We can get to where get to China is in terms of, as a, as a country, in terms of size, proportion. Uh, we can get there. We can become a developed country. We can become uh, agriculturally uh, self-sufficient. Uh, but we just have not been able to do it yet. We, I don't think we have got the right policies in place, uh, whereas China has. Uh, and the reason I think that China can do that is because China thinks not just five years ahead. China thinks 20, 25 years ahead. So that's a good example in terms of... Um, actual uh, economic and political policy. I think um, now China is not only uh, self-sufficient, but China also exports to the rest of the world. So China wants to be, especially the Hanan province, uh, wants to be the kitchen of the world, which is something very uh, uh, progressive in terms of looking at the future. So I think Sri Lanka can easily uh, uh, learn from the Chinese experience, learn from our big brother, and uh, develop these things for ourselves. I'm not saying that we have to copy everything that China has done and just take back what the Chinese uh, are doing. No, we have to have something Sri Lankan. We'll have to have our own solutions, but certainly China can help us, not just in terms of building bridges and roads, and, but really in the, in the agriculture sector, as I've learned in this trip. Um, and this delegation has, is really impressed by what, what the Chinese... Uh, leadership, the Communist Party and the Chinese government has done uh, right throughout China uh, in terms of developing the agriculture sector. What advice would you give to China to enhance its pursuit of rural revitalization? I think that in the long term, uh, especially with the 
in case that uh, an higher class, a medium and higher class uh, will go growing, the demand, the internal demand of uh, good qualities of products will be raised and so you, you will also uh, be pushed to invest not only on a massive production but also in a, a better production so it means also that you cannot um, you cannot uh, have um, a so high number of products but you can have a smaller but very uh, very uh, with very high quality and so very very request not only in your internal market in China but also outside I hope also in Europe to appreciate the importance of rural vitalization one must recognize its historical roots rural reform was the cradle of reform it has been a perennial topic at every party Congress and year after year at every annual meeting of the nation's highest legislative and consultative bodies. The CPC came to power supported by peasants and farmers, yet farmers could not own their own farmland. According to socialist ideology at the time, the country as a whole, not the people in the country, owned the land. A leading rural expert told me, historically, few countries by the time they have reached the middle phase of industrialization would still be plagued by agricultural issues. As land value skyrocketed, great wealth was created in urban areas. Farmers had 30-year leases, which allowed them to farm, but because few were able to monetize the land, the wealth gap between urban and rural areas was exacerbated. Everyone knows this must be rectified. Currently, pilot programs enable rural land use rights to be transferred via markets, enabling farmers to subcontract, lease, exchange, or swap their land use rights, or join shareholding entities with their farmland, all of which generates new income for farmers all without abandoning ultimate state ownership. The party's target date for rural vitalization is 2035. I find fascinating the collection of characteristics describing rural vitalization. Thriving businesses, pleasant living environments, social etiquette and civility, effective governance and prosperity. Questions remain, such as what happens to land rights if a farmer moves or dies. To appreciate why rural vitalization is now national strategy is to be closer to China.